Hey everybody, it's Lon Seib, and we just got in our first laptop with an Intel Ultra processor on board. This is the new HP Spectre X360 14. This is a two-in-one that can flip into a tablet if you want. It's a really nice machine here, and the new chip actually performs quite nicely compared to the prior generation. So we're going to take a closer look at this laptop and what it's all about in just a second. But I do want to let you know in the interest of full disclosure that this is on loan from HP. So we're done with this. It goes back to them. All the opinions you're about to hear are my own. No one is paying for this review, nor has anyone reviewed or approved what you're about to see before it was uploaded. So let's get into it now and see what this new laptop is all about. Now, the price point on this starts at $1,449 right now and works its way up from there. This one, as configured, is $1,899. But even the lower end units, I think, are pretty nicely configured. Now, this one at the top of the line has the Intel Ultra 7 155H processor. This has the Arc GPU on board, and it's got 16 cores. Six of them for performance, eight for efficiency, and two low-power MPU cores that are designed for artificial intelligence tasks. And there's not all that much that takes advantage of this chip just yet. But as you'll see in a few minutes, its graphics performance is significantly better than prior editions. So you'll be able to make use of this power right out of the box with existing software. The base model has the Ultra 5 processor and 16 gigs of RAM, but it's got the same display and the same fit and finish. Now the display is a 14-inch OLED. It is running at 2,880 by 1,800 for its resolution, that is a 2.8K display. For brightness, it's at 400 nits, but in HDR mode, it can go up to 500. It supports a variable refresh rate between 48 and 120 hertz. You can lock it in at 120 or 60 hertz, depending on what your preferences are as well. So a very nice display here, it looks spectacular. And of course, you've got those deep contrasts that OLED displays can provide you. It does have a 16 by 10 aspect ratio, so it is a little taller than some laptops from a couple of years ago that were at a more narrow 16 by 9, so it's very well suited for document editing and web browsing. Now the weight on this comes in at 3.19 pounds or 1.45 kilograms. It's a little heavier perhaps than an Ultrabook might be, but not terribly so. It feels very well balanced and very nicely built. It is all aluminum, so it's got a nice premium feel to it. One of the things that I like about these HP Spectres is that they put the ports, or some of them, on the corners. So here on this corner, you have your headphone jack, and you can see how that plays out there. And you've got your USB-A port here for attaching peripherals. On the other side, you have two Thunderbolt 4 ports. These are full-service ports that can be used for video output, but also power in and, of course, using Thunderbolt and USB devices. You've got one here on the corner and another one here on the right-hand side of the unit. There's no card reader or anything else on here for ports, but they do give you a couple of dongles in the box, including a little docking station that gives you additional USB and video output, along with just a regular video out dongle as well. So they give you kind of things to make up for the lack of ports on here but you'll have to remember to take those peripherals with you. Now, I was very pleased with the keyboard on this. It's got very nice, large, and well-spaced keys. It is backlit. You've got a fingerprint reader here in the corner that doubles as the power button. You also have decent key travel on here, which is nice for such a small laptop. So the keyboard, I think, is very well implemented. The trackpad, though, needs some work. This is a haptic trackpad, meaning that it doesn't have any physical click. It detects the pressure of your finger, and then it will make it feel like you are clicking. And generally it works okay, but I'm finding that it's not always getting things right. Sometimes if my wrist just happens to be resting on it, it will misinterpret what I'm intending to do. And because it's such a large trackpad, it's not hard to set it off in the wrong direction. So in a couple of instances, it just stopped registering clicks for a while. In other instances, it registers clicks too often with this, just a light touch. So I think they have to adjust a little bit on the software side to make the trackpad work a little better. I don't think it's broken hardware. It just needs some adjustments in software to get it detecting gestures more reliably. So that was the one frustrating point on the keyboard deck here. Now it has a nice high resolution webcam. I was able to get it to output at 1440p 
As you can see here, I was playing around with some of the Intel AI features to blur out the image there in hardware, and that worked pretty nicely. And you also have a shutter on the lens that you can activate from the keyboard here, and that will physically cover the lens up uh, with that keystroke and also deactivate the camera so you can have some privacy when you need it. Now the audio quality out of the speakers is quite good, about what you would expect for a higher end laptop, a nice range of sound for music and movies, and certainly more than adequate for doing web conferences. One thing I did notice though is that the sound gets a bit muffled when you put it into the display orientation like this, because a lot of the sound is getting forced into the surface of your desk. So I think for the best results for music and movies, you'll want to leave it in laptop mode or attach a pair of headphones up to it. All right, let's take a look now and see how this thing performs. We'll begin with some web browsing and work our way up from there. One thing I noticed is that everything really springs to life very quickly on this. That is, of course, due in part to its processor, but also because this display runs at 120 hertz. So things do get on the screen a little bit quicker and things respond to your clicks a little bit cl quicker and it's noticeable. So it's a very nice browsing experience, especially if you're coming from an older computer that ran at 60 hertz. So all in, we're good here. This also has Wi-Fi 7 on board, although I only have a Wi-Fi 6 access point here in the studio, but the Wi-Fi performance was also quite good on here, so no concerns there. I did play back some video from my YouTube channel at 1080p at 60 frames per second. I was able to do that without any dropped frames. We did get a couple at the outset as the screen was rendering in. After that, everything settled down and the playback was perfect. And I think you won't have any trouble with Twitch or Netflix or any of the other media streaming sites you might use. And of course, web browsing here is also going to run quite nicely on it, along with all of your other Word and Excel documents too. And on the browserbench.org speedometer benchmark test, we got a score of 306. That puts this machine pretty close to what we've seen out of other Intel machines over the last couple of years. But I think the emphasis on this new chip is its graphical horsepower, and you'll see some big changes there when we look at gaming in a little bit. Now, as far as battery life is concerned, I think these new Intel chips are doing a lot better than some of the prior editions did. On this machine, if you keep the brightness down at a reasonable level and stick to basic tasks like web browsing and word processing, you should be able to get nine to 10 hours, if not a little bit more, out of the workday. I noticed a very nice bump in overall battery life here on this new unit. Let's take a look at the pen and then we'll push it a little bit harder. All right, so we've got the included pen here. As the pen gets closer to the display, it detects its presence and then it will ignore my wrist being rested on the screen here. And as I write, it feels pretty nice here. It's got very little latency. It responds very well. It also detects pressure, so when I push down harder, I get a darker line. Uh, so altogether here, I think a very nice experience. Now, one thing to note is that the screen is a bit smooth, so it might feel a little bit slippery, um, but beyond that, I think it is a decent pen experience here. And of course, you've got that very nice OLED display, which looks great when you're doing artwork. Now, the pen doesn't have a garage that it can be placed into when it's not in use, but if you point the pen towards you and get it close to the side here, it will hang on pretty nicely with a magnet. All right, let's move on now to some video editing. I've got DaVinci Resolve loaded up here with a 4K 60 frames per second video project. And what I'm gonna do is just drop in a cross dissolve just to see how fast it can render things out in real time here. So we'll go ahead and bring the timeline back there and run through it. And as you can see, it was able to do that with uh, pretty much no lag or anything like that. Now you can see I'm having a little bit of trouble with the trackpad here, but we're gonna switch the transition over and see how that goes. All very, very quick and responsive here. And this has been kind of the theme of this laptop with this new chip. A lot of graphically intensive tasks do quite well. Is it enough to do super high end 4K video editing? Probably not. But the kind of editing that I do here on this channel works quite well on here. And I generally just do 30 frames per second at 4K, but it's able to handle 60 here without issue. The system fan is running a little bit. It's barely audible, so all in, a really nice experience here. Great performance out of this new Intel chip, especially if you're doing lower end editing. If you're doing higher end stuff like color grading and higher end 3D effects or whatever, you might want to attach an external GPU to one of the Thunderbolt ports. All right, let's take a look at some gaming now, and this is where you can really see the difference this new Intel processor makes. 
I'm running Red Dead Redemption 2 at 1920 by 1200. I am at the lowest settings, but check it out. My frame rates are right now over 50. In fact, right here, I'm at 57. Now, when I get closer to a building or more activity, it does drop down into the mid to upper 40s, but generally it is very playable, well beyond the 30 frames per second or less we would get at this resolution on the prior edition processor, and it looks great too. So very, very cool to see just how far we're getting on a single chip now, and you could never do something like this on an older laptop from just a couple of years ago. So this is really cool to see this. And although some games like Starfield might be pushing it on here, you've got decades of games that will run at very, very playable frame rates here on a very thin and light laptop. So Intel has really put a lot into the graphical performance of these new chips. And surprisingly, the cooling fan is very, very quiet here. I'm not even hearing it running all that much. I can hear it kind of under the surface here, but it's not distracting at all. So altogether, a real jump up in performance and efficiency. Now, a little bit earlier, producer Jake ran a few other games on here. This is Doom Eternal, also at 1920 by 1200 low settings. Check this out, 60 to 90 frames per second, generally in the 70s as he was running around the world there. That was pretty good. He also ran Fortnite. Uh, this is 1920 by 1200, also at low settings, and we were getting between 40 and 70 frames per second. So it's very conceivable that you can get uh, above 60 if you adjust your settings and resolution appropriately here without having to use an external GPU. So all in, a very nice experience here for casual gamers that want a practical laptop, but also want some playable performance when they need it. So here you go. Good stuff here with this new Intel chip. And on the 3D Mark Time Spy benchmark test, we got a score of 3,857. This is by far the best score we've seen out of an Intel processor ever. And you can compare that to an i7-1360P on the list. We're pretty much double the performance when it comes to graphics. And it's also besting a Ryzen 7840HS on a mini PC from AMD. And one of the best things about the AMD and Intel rivalry here is that we are seeing year over year huge performance gains as they each try to one up the other one with more power efficiency and greater processing capabilities. And we're really winning here as consumers, I think. So all in a great jump in performance here on the Intel side. I can't wait to see what AMD does to respond. And on the 3D Mark stress test, we got a score of 97.1%. The processor kept itself relatively cool during that period of time as well. So no real performance drop off here, a very quiet fan and all in. It seems like this is a very power efficient device that delivers great performance. Now, normally at this stage of the review, we like to take a look at its Linux compatibility. Unfortunately, I was unable to get this machine to boot off of my external SSDs that I have some versions of Ubuntu installed on. I tried everything, I went through the BIOS and disabled all the usual security features, but it just wouldn't let me boot. So maybe there's a BIOS update that might come in the future to enable that, but right now I'm going to recommend this one uh, only for Windows users. But I have to say, I am very impressed with the performance that I saw out of this, especially on the gaming side. It's a very big leap over prior generation Intel processors. The machine runs very efficiently, the battery life is good, the fan is quiet, and they just have to make a few improvements on the trackpad, I think, and this will be a real winner. So good stuff here from HP, good stuff from Intel as well, and I'm sure we'll be seeing more of these processors in the near future. That's gonna do it for now. Until next time, this is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters, Brian Parker, Budley, Hot Sauce and Video Games, Steve Green, and Amda Brown. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more.
And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.